Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Unified Standard Development First Draft Launch. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be posted on the Hub. We encourage you to ask questions. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Now on to Laura with Textile Exchange. Laura? Thank you, Rose, and hi, everyone. Very happy to be here with you today. So we are in the middle uh, well, I first, sorry, I will introduce myself. I am Laura Kohler, who is heading up our standards and assurance teams at Textile Exchange. And so I'm going to be uh, talking through um, some good news that we have about the development of the unified standard. And then I have Trini Gantner also joining, um, and she will share some more um, information about how to participate. And what we would like to introduce to you is that the unified standard is now out for open consultation. So before I jump into giving some of the, the background information about what we are doing with the unified standard, that is the headline. And the main reason for holding this webinar today is to make sure everybody knows that we do have a first draft of the standard and the criteria that we've been working on available for public viewing and feedback. And so we are going to give some important information about how you can participate in that. And But before we get to those details, I do want to make sure that everybody that is listening in understands um, what we are talking about, what we have been working on, and that is building a unified standard system across the standards that we have today and the materials that are included in those standards. And so the what has brought us here today are uh, basically two key objectives. The first being that because we are working across multiple different standards, we have determined that it will be much more efficient for participants in our standard systems to be able to have one unified system for how they're um, engaging with standards and certification. But a really important goal that we have with the, the next evolution on our standards is to look at our Climate Plus goal as an organization and as a textile industry and understand where we can take um, impact areas from that climate goal and incorporate them into criteria in a standards context. So those are the two overarching objectives we have with the unified standard system and will play out in what you're seeing in the draft that's available for uh, review. So on the next slide, the, what I want to explain about the, the existing standards that we have today, this gives a good visual for people to understand why it's important to take the different material standards that we have and harmonize them under one system because each has been developed with its own um, format and objectives and there are nuances between the different standards that make them different, but we do have organizations that are participating in multiple standards based on the materials that they use. So we do know it will be much more efficient to make sure we have that aligned system for how they engage with the standards. The other thing I want to mention just visually from this slide is when you see the different material standards, we've used those criteria that exist today that are part of certificates that are issued today as the base for the unified standard development. So we have taken pre-existing criteria, moved them into the unified standard development process, but then we've been looking at how can we adapt and move forward with those criteria. So on the next slide, this is showing our future state with where we're moving with the unified standard. And that is on the left side of the screen, the different material categories that we're working in. There are some new ones there that I'll talk about in a minute. But looking at the existing criteria that we have today and where we can take those criteria in terms of the impact areas that we have related to the Climate Plus goal. So that means there are revisions being made and that you will see in the, this first draft to those criteria that have pre-existed. There are also new criteria that we've introduced in the first draft of the standard where we've identified that there may be gaps related to where we want to go with our Climate Plus impact areas. 
There may also be just areas that we've identified as improvements. So based on practices that we have in the standards today that need to be moving forward um, on that continuum of continuous improvement for responsible practices. So when you are looking at the first draft of the standard, it is covering the raw material management part of the supply chain, as well as the first processing stages. So taking that raw material uh, from that state and moving it um, into its first processing to get it ready for pre-spinning. Then the rest of the supply chain shown on this screen to the right, uh, the tiers one through three, as we say in the textile industry, that is remaining the same in our content claim standard. So that's the chain of custody standard that we have that enables the tracking and handling of material through the supply chain. So that will continue to exist and support the unified standard in the future. So then moving next, it's important for people to understand the different fibers and materials that we have included in the scope of the standard. One thing I want to mention, because the, the way that we're delivering this information today is in the context of there being a first draft that is out for consultation. So I want to make sure that people know that all the different materials you see listed here are not necessarily covered in this first draft. So this is a giving you a picture of where we want the final standard system to be. So all of the different materials that we want to have included when we move to finalizing the standard. But it's an iterative process. Um, I'm sure you can see that covering all of these different materials and the practices related to how they're managed is quite an undertaking. So it's not something that we can easily do all at once. So some of these materials need to be introduced um, over time. A couple of the materials were taking a deeper dive with some discussion groups to understand the processing specific to that material area to give us better insight on the type of criteria that we need. So the goal we have is by the time we get to the second draft to have all of the applicable uh, criteria covering all of the materials we intend to have in the final standard available for review. Of course, even with that second draft, we'll still be taking into consideration feedback that we get and further refining from there. The other thing I want to highlight uh, from this image on the materials, there are some items that have an asterisk, and those are materials that are good candidates for recognizing external programs and standards that already exist. So rather than ourselves um, introducing a whole new standard at the raw material level, if there is already another standard that we've identified is moving in the same direction that we are with our Climate Plus goal, we want to explore opportunities to partner with that external organization and um, be able to recognize their standard and the related certified uh, materials coming out of that standard and raw material process and recognize them going into the unified standard system. So that is a process, uh, a program for recognition that is under development right now. We are planning to release information about what that program looks like in more detail when we move to the second draft. It's just a really important note for people to know now so that when you open up the first draft of the standard, you're not necessarily going to see all of these materials listed and or you're not necessarily going to see a complete picture for all uh, criteria that would be applicable to those materials. And so then if we go to the next slide, uh, this is something that we've presented before to let people understand, first of all, you know, what are the climate plus impact areas? Those are listed in the tiles across the top of the screen. So these are, they're not um, listed in exactly the same way that we have the criteria divided within the, the draft standard that you will see, but they are the impact areas where we've looked at 
what are the long-term impacts that we want to see the real change on the ground? And what are the outcomes that will demonstrate that we're moving in the right direction on these impact areas? So we've gone through a process to identify that trajectory, and then we've used that information to look at, well, what are the practices? What are best practices, responsible practices that will lead to those outcomes? And from there, we've developed criteria that you will see in the draft standard. The criteria that we've included in the first draft are the conformance related. So those are um, actual requirements that are evaluated by the certification body auditors to make a determination uh, for a certification decision, whether um, a certificate is issued, whether there's a non-conformity that needs to be addressed. That's what conformance related criteria refers to. You will also see in the first draft criteria that are labeled as leadership. Leadership means that these are areas that we would like to see organizations moving. So they're areas for improvement. They're more like recommendations. So um, those of you participating in our current standards, some of them have recommendations already. And so you're familiar with that concept. That's essentially what leadership criteria are. That means that they're not specifically evaluated for conformance. If the organization is implementing areas that um, align with the leadership criteria, then we'll be able to record that in the results of the audit and have that base information to know where an, a specific organization is in their trajectory on where we like to uh, need to see organizations moving in relation to the Climate Plus goal. Uh, the last bit I want to mention on this slide is the impact indicators. So we have these three categories of how we're um, defining the criteria. In the first draft, you will not see impact indicators. That's part of what we're developing for the second draft of the standard. But indicators are areas where we plan to measure um, progress. So it's going to be specific information that's collected as part of the audit process. So we can look at how are things uh, moving with individual organizations, but we can also use, in it, use it for monitoring and evaluation as a whole. So we can look at a specific impact area in a specific region or for a specific type of raw material management and understand you know, where we are as an industry in relation to um, the climate plus outcomes that we want to achieve. So that information will be available um, later this year for comment. And then I believe is, we're, let's move to the next. This is where I'm going to hand it over to Trini to talk a bit more about how to participate. Yes, thank you, Laura, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Trini, and I'm the Senior Manager of Standards. And I will be sharing a little bit more about the process and the timeline and the scope. Laura has talked to us a little bit already about what the components are. And um, we will be releasing the standard in two stages, so to speak. So the first draft is currently live for public consultation as of May 15th, and public consultation will uh, conclude on July 17th. And in this first draft, the box here to the left, you will find um, different components, some of which Laura had ran us through from the conformance related criteria and leadership criteria to different sections, how it is broken up in the standard that you will see again as you open the, the file. So there will be an organizational management section and a human rights and livelihood section, an area of land use, animal welfare, and facility and environmental. In support of um, understanding the uh, public consultation and the draft version one of the standard, we have also created summary papers. That Laura will run us through in a moment or highlights thereof. But know that you can also find those on the website as well. And I will be sharing a little bit more about where to find what towards the end of the webinar. 
sorry, actually, I should go back to the second draft. So the second draft of the unified standard will be live towards the end of the year. It will include all the components of the first draft, plus additional new components that you see pictured here, and also refined um, criteria from learnings we have made during the first public consultation. So the second draft will be a little bit closer to the final um, than the first draft that is currently out is. And it will also include impact indicators. We uh, are planning to put out um, draft of policies that will potentially be released alongside the unified standard sharing different concepts. We will also add additional criteria around the chain of custody, the use of trademarks, and uh, group certification. And then also it will include additional information and criteria around tiers one, two, and three, as well as share more about the recognition program that Laura had mentioned earlier as well. So in terms of where we are this year, uh, we are now uh, in the middle of the first public consultation, which started May 15th and will resume July 14th. While the public consultation is happening, we are already fiercely drafting towards draft two of the unified standard, which is um, scheduled to go out in September. So we are simultaneously working on the scope, the new scopes of draft two, while also as um, feedback is rolling in, taking that into consideration to refine the criteria we currently have. Then in September, we plan on making the second consultation live. Um, we will run this public consultation through our conference in London at the end of October, where we will hold additional information and feedback sessions as well on the unified standard. And then our goal is to make the standard final towards the end of this year. And next, let's look at what that means when the standard is final. So looking ahead, uh, if we now continue, we now have a final standard that will be released and it will then be made available to the public to enable preparation in the, in the following months and years. So 2024 is what we call the year of implementation where a lot of the preparation is happening to get uh, all the systems aligned across textile exchange to ensure we have all the associated documents and policies in place and to really prepare for um, yeah, the full implementation of the new system. 2025 will be the year when the standard is first uh, effective and will first be available for auditing. That doesn't mean that auditing has to happen by 2025 to the new standard. There is a time when our existing standards and the unified standard will exist in parallel. But we foresee that auditing may be possible in 2025. That is also the year when we plan on beginning baseline data and really gearing up towards making the new standard system mandatory in 2026. So come 2026, the standard is estimated to be mandatory. And at that point, you can no longer certify to our existing current standards, but you will have to certify to the unified standard system. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Laura. Great. Thank you, Trini, for running us through those details. What I want to do before I jump right into the topic on the slide here is just let you know, um, Trini mentioned that on the web page we have set up for the draft standard and all of the information that you need to um, have available and, and click on and open up, there are summary papers available. The three summary papers are covering um, specific materials. So there's one for recycled materials, 
for animal materials and then fiber crops, which is focused on cotton at this time. So those are the summary papers. When you open those papers, there is additional content in there about other concept areas that we've developed in the standard. So then you'll be able to understand, for example, when, it when you're looking at organizational management and the need for having um, documented procedures and training systems in place that um, span across all different types of materials that you may be working in, there is some basic information in those summary papers to let you know what we've been working on and what to expect in the standard. One of those um, concept areas or what is part of our climate plus impact areas is human rights and livelihoods. So I'm going to start with that topic and then give a couple um, other summary paper highlights from the specific materials. So what I want to share from human rights and livelihoods is a shift in our approach. So we've taken a much more comprehensive uh, view by working with external organizations to unpack what can we do to be more meaningful and effective in how audits are conducted for um, areas related to ensuring human rights and livelihood, sustainable livelihoods. And so that is a shift towards looking at a risk-based approach that is understanding from an organization, each individual organization, where are the risks um, that could be infringements to human rights and what are the systems that they're setting up to proactively um, be ahead of those risks. So how are they preventing those infringements from happening based on the risks to their organization, which may be based on the risks um, of the, the specific sector that they're working in, the, the region that they're located, different aspects like that. So that what they're showing as part of the audit process is that they have a due diligence-based system set up based on those risks. And then, of course, when actual events are happening, incidences are happening, that's where they need to be able to demonstrate that they, their system that they have in place is effective and is implemented. Uh, in a timely manner. So it's it's really shifting that approach of the type of criteria that are designed and how those are audited. The other approach that we're taking is scaling the criteria um, based on the size of the organization that is being audited. So in the standard, there is a new um, section called performance determination that is directly lined up with the criteria themselves. We've introduced that part of the standard specifically right now in the first draft for human rights and livelihoods. So that was the main impetus uh, was that we need to have that approach to the criteria to make them appropriate to the size and scale of an operation. We're going to look at you know how we can use that concept, the performance determination for other areas in the standard, but that's primarily where you will see it used in the first draft. The other um, key thing that I want to mention about human rights and livelihoods is that, of course, there are many other organizations out there that are already tackling this area, that they already have standards and auditing systems set up. So we do want to look at, like what I was mentioning before about recognition for specific raw materials and standards that may exist for the management of those raw materials, that same concept of recognition is what we're looking at for human rights and livelihoods as well, so that we can partner with other organizations that are already working in this area and have that same direction of travel that we're developing uh, with a risk-based approach and do in focusing on due diligence systems. So we do hope to be able to recognize other standards that are already um, tackling this topic. And then where uh, there may be situations where that doesn't exist, and then we have our criteria to be able to be used. The, the So on the right side of the screen, what you see are the different subsections of the criteria. So when you open up the standard and you are looking at human rights and livelihoods, the criteria are divided into these subsections. The last one on the screen at the bottom is the specific context. The example I left on here is waste pickers related to recycled materials. There are also the, another 
specific context relates to worker housing, for example. So we uh, have recognized that there are some areas that are specific to materials and how those uh, materials are sourced and handled or managed. And so then we wanted to make sure and introduce some specific criteria that are addressing those areas. So those are some important things to keep in mind when you look at this part of the standard. If we move to the next slide, it is about recycled materials. And so uh, again, in the standard, uh, you are able to uh, focus on specific materials of interest. We do have instructions in the standard itself, as well as in the summary papers of how to understand the different um, columns of information. I'll say columns because the standard was drafted in an Excel file, and we do make that Excel file available for viewing um, as part of the consultation. So you will see it set up in that format with the columns. When you move all the way to the right in the columns, there is one for material, and there is instruction how if you're viewing it via the Excel, you can select for specific material types. And so recycled is one of those. And one thing I want to point out is that if you're working in man-made cellulosic fibers, you would need to look at recycled and MMCF to be able to get a complete picture of um, all of the criteria that apply to your um, operation and that specific material. And that's the case uh, for other, other material categories as well that you can go and, and specifically look at for example, uh, cotton or wool as well. So like I had mentioned at the beginning uh, of the presentation, the unified standard is uh, has impact criteria that have been developed at the raw material level and first processing. And so that's um, also true for you know, human rights and livelihoods where those criteria are applicable in the supply chain. For recycled materials, this means that we're looking at once that reclaimed feedstock comes into a facility, the processing of taking that reclaimed input and breaking it back down into the building blocks that are needed for uh, manufacturing new textile um, inputs. So moving um, into whether it's uh, pulp, the pellets moving to filament. So taking that reclaimed input and the processing that needs to happen to get to that uh, second phase of the material that's used for further processing that typically then would go into the, the spinning phase. So that's where the criteria are focused. And so when it comes to um, impact areas such as how waste is managed, which chemicals are used, um, the energy that's required for that manufacturing process, that's the part of the supply chain that those type of criteria are focused on, and that's where you will be able to view the draft criteria that we have available. Um, so the, let's see if there's any other, the other point I want to mention about recycled is, of course, that we have the global recycled standard, the GRS similar to what I mentioned at the beginning where we already have our pre-existing standards and the criteria within those standards have served as the foundation moving into the unified standard. That is how it's applicable for recycled, looking at the GRS criteria and adapting those uh, for the unified standard system. We do know that there have been some areas of um, challenges and complications for specific uh, um, chemical requirements in the GRS. So that is a specific area that we are unpacking further to understand what we need to do as we move into the second draft. How do we need to look at restricted substances and, and those um, the chemicals that are used in that very initial phase of processing and where we need to take those type of criteria into the unified standard. So definitely getting feedback on that area within the industry is really important to us, but also for you to know that we are taking more time to look at where we need to move um, into the second draft. Then if we move to the next topic, it's animal materials. And you can see listed in that first bullet, which are the specific animal materials that are um, covered in the standard. Like I mentioned earlier, not you won't see necessarily um, all of the applicable criteria uh, because, for example, we have cashmere 
um, as a potential candidate for recognition of pre-existing standards that are already working at that tier four level in the supply chain. So you're not going to see all of these um, materials covered in the current first draft, but that you will get more information about the recognition program as we move into the second draft. One of the important shifts to highlight with the animal materials in the first draft of the unified standard is looking at the five domains of animal welfare rather than the five freedoms. So the five domains puts an emphasis on um, ensuring that there's positive experiences provided to the animals in their raising, rather than looking at how to avoid negative situations. So you'll be able to see that shift in how the criteria are written in this first draft. The other important thing is when you um, are able to look at the standard and the different sections of criteria, there is one that is referred to as land use. So that's how the land is managed on a particular farm. And we've, we already have land use criteria in the animal material standards, the, the animal fiber specifically, the responsible animal uh, fiber framework standards that we have. So those land use criteria served as a base for the unified standard, but we're looking at them from the lens of our climate plus goal and understanding where do we need to continue moving forward in how we're looking at land use practices um, to in order to be achieving the climate plus outcomes that we need to see happening. Uh, and the last bit that I'll mention here is when you're looking at the facility and environmental criteria, those are also applicable to how animal materials are processed. So in terms of um, well, the human rights and livelihoods, so the treatment of the workers required in those processing steps, the types of chemicals that may be used, the waste management. So there are uh, those type of areas that apply to our climate plus goal that are applicable to animal materials as well. And especially uh, it may be some of the processing that's happening or uh, chemicals that are used at the farm level, but also moving into that first processing such as scouring. And then the, the last material category that I wanna highlight uh, before we move into the, um, the next topic is fiber crops. So right now, we are focused on cotton in the unified standard. So we've taken a, um, a process to look at where we wanna see criteria related to best practices in managing cotton production at the farm level, as well as the first phase of processing, which is the gin for cotton. So we've gone through a process to look at the climate plus outcome areas, and how those relate to responsible practices on the ground and have done that intensive process of developing criteria. Of course, looking at many other systems um, to gain insight on the type of um, important criteria to cover. Also looking at pre-existing land use criteria we have in our animal material standards. So we had a, a base to start from. But the important um, mention that I wanna have here is that for cotton, it's another candidate for that potential recognition at the, the tier four raw material farming level. So we do recognize that there are other standards that are looking at responsible practices for cotton production. And um, we're checking the opportunities to be able to partner with those other organizations and work together at that farm um, practice level with the criteria. So it may be that we are able to recognize an external standard and the certified inputs coming from that standard into the unified standard system as that material moves to the GIN. Um, I believe that I've talked about that, of course, the, the focus for land use has is on the climate plus goal. So that was primarily what we were looking at those different impact areas when it relates to cotton production. It's a testing ground for us to be able to um, hopefully add hemp and flax, flax used for linen, um, in a future version of the standard, but that's those are not materials that you'll see in the, the current standard. 
And let's see, uh, so similar to what I mentioned about animal materials, when you look at the facility and environmental section of the standard, that may relate to chemical use such as pesticides or fertilizers um, at the farm level, but it's also looking at related environmental practices or criteria for what's happening at the gin as well. And that I believe covers the, the summary there from me, Trini, and I believe you're talking on the next one. Yes, thank you, Laura. So um, Steph had plopped in the information earlier with the link to the website that holds all the information. It is put again here that we have a on textileexchange.org, a specific website um, called Standards Transition that focuses on um, a lot of the information we have shared today. Uh, and uh, in addition to how to actually participate. So what you see here is a screenshot of the online feedback form. So we are providing two ways to provide feedback during this public consultation. One is online, one is offline. The online version is a feedback form that uh, first prompts you to um, share your uh, personal information, so your name, your organization, where you're located. And then you will be seeing a screen where you can type in your feedback. We are making available the standards draft as an Excel, and that also doubles as the offline feedback form, and I'll get to that in a moment, as well as a PDF. So if you wanted to provide feedback online via the feedback form that you see pictured here, you would open that feedback form and also in parallel look at either the Excel sheet um, or the PDF version of the standard. If you choose to provide feedback offline, the best tool to use there is the Excel file um, here. And you will also have multiple tabs in there. The first one asking who you are so that we can also identify uh, the, the feedback giver, so to speak. Then there's also a little bit more of uh, explaining information at the beginning, what the structure of the standard is, how you can maneuver and navigate through the Excel file. And then you will see a comment column at the end that allows you to track line by line if you choose feedback on the individual criteria. Once you are uh, done with the Excel file and you choose to track your feedback this way, you can email it back to standards at textileexchange.org. One thing that I want to note also is that you are free and able to fill either form or document out multiple times if you choose to. We know it is a, a big document. So online, for example, um, you can add, if you want to do it in one go, you can add additional comments at the end, but you can also fill that feedback form out multiple times. So let's say you dedicate an hour one day, you hit submit, and then you can come back uh, the next day and just resubmit it again. And um, yeah, same with offline, of course, though that is a little bit easier to just save, close, and come back to it, and then submit it once you are done. But if there are any questions, um, feel free at any given time also to send those in to standards at textile exchange, but know that we have a lot of information on the standards transition website from how to participate, what the timeline is, the project plan, um, the different ways to get to the summary papers as well that Laura mentioned earlier. And yeah, the reminder of the timeline again is July 14th. So that is about four weeks away. Um, we would appreciate your feedback. The sooner we can get it, uh, the better we have a chance to process it and weave in learnings also into draft two which is estimated to go live in September. And with that, we are going to move into our Q&A session. And we have received one question here that I'm going to read back. 
Will the content claim standard cover human rights and livelihoods indicators as well to ensure that human rights risks from tier one to three are not neglected as well now that tier fours are covered? So I expect I'll answer that one, um, Trini, and, and then if there's anything else for my team that you want to share, definitely um, add to it. So the, the unified standard is focused on that tier four and then the very first processing. So when we're looking at what we've developed for um, human rights, as well as the other impact areas, it is right now focused at that level, and then we the content claim standard will be the chain of custody. What we're looking at are what are the options uh, around those impact areas, such as human rights and livelihoods for tiers one through three, but not that we will have actual requirements that those have to be um, part of the conformance that's demonstrated for certification to the CCS, the content claim standard. But we do want to provide options for how those areas will be captured if uh, an organization chooses to do that. It could be that we're capturing information from other standards that they're participating in and that we want to record that information in our track it database so that we can have a complete picture for the whole supply chain or we may be looking at other mechanisms to do that. So that's a, a part of a, a sort of a supplementary area to the future standard system that we're exploring, what are the options so that we can bring that back to the community for comment. It's not something that uh, people will specifically see addressed right now. Perfect, thank you, Laura. Another question that has come in is, we appreciate the focus on impact-based criteria for the raw materials stage a lot. However, one thing uh, confused us while having a look at the first draft of the unified standard. Did we understand correctly that textile exchange is creating criteria for the cultivation of cotton right now, which is at the level of better cotton, GML allowed? Um, is it correct that what was once the focus of textile exchange, it will not be possible anymore to have a standard for safeguarding and tracing organic cotton? Okay, so there, there are a couple questions in here. I think uh, probably now what I explained on the fiber crops slide about what we've done uh, for cotton, that, that may be clear that we have developed criteria at that um, farming level. So the practices on the ground for cultivating cotton, that is part of the draft criteria that you will see in um, the, the standard that is available for consultation right now. Um, there is There are criteria related to GMO, so that is something to look at what we've done there. But again, I just wanna emphasize that how the, the criteria for cotton are used in the final standard system is something where we are exploring different options. So will we continue to have the criteria that are used by textile exchange certification bodies for auditing at the farm level, or will those criteria be used as a basis for evaluating other standards that already exist and then recognizing their, uh, the work that they're already doing on the ground, the audit systems they have in place, and then accepting that um, certified cotton input at the gin phase of the unified standard. So there's different options of how exactly we will capture cotton in the unified standard system. Um, and so that, that's a, an important clarification, but definitely you will see cotton related um, production farming criteria. So be aware of that. The other thing, uh, the other question in here is about what's happening with um, tracing organic cotton. So we do uh, have the organic uh, content uh, standard, the OCS that will continue to exist. We're looking at what, how will that standard and our work in organic evolve over time in relation to the unified standard system. They will exist in parallel uh, for the foreseeable future, but we are looking at, are there ways that we can work on organic within the unified standard system to make it more efficient? So we're exploring all of those different options with more information to be shared when we get 
closer to that, um, what that looks like in the future so that we can get feedback on that as well. But definitely for the time being, uh, we do still have the organic content standard that will continue to exist. Thank you, Laura. Um, before I move to the next one, I just wanted to reiterate that was also a question that was received when the two public consultations will be available. So the first one, draft one, is available now until July 14th. And the second draft is estimated to go live in September, a little bit later this year. So moving on to the next question that came in is, is it correct that you will no longer have criteria for the supply chain when it comes to recycled materials as it was in the GRS or is this topic covered in the second draft? So in the, the supply chain, so the tiers one through three as recycled material passes through each of those um, sites, um, we the CCS is what will apply in the unified standard system to be able to track and handle recycled materials. The question might relate more to um, similarly another question above about what's happening with human rights and livelihoods and the rest of the supply chain. So for the, the GRS today, of course, covers all of the, the same type of criteria, regardless of which point within, um, you know, tiers one through four that's participating in certification. So human rights and livelihoods and chemical use, all those type of impact related criteria are applicable throughout the entire supply chain. That is a, a shift right now and in, in that what we've developed for the unified standard, of course, is focused on that initial processing of recycled material. And then the content claim standard does not include those type of criteria. So the way the content claim standard looks today is essentially how it will look in the future. So it's about the chain of custody, the tracking and handling of that material. Um, and so then it relates back to the, the same way that I answered before of looking at what are the options to have those impact areas captured, but not in a uh, system that is mandatory, but more in a voluntary fashion where uh, there may be those type of criteria that are evaluated and we're capturing that information, but not requiring it to achieve the CCS certificate in the rest of the supply chain. So again, that, that's a topic that we are unpacking that we want to get specific feedback on how that looks for organizations, um, what they're, where they would like to see the system move. So it, it's not something that is, of course, covered in the draft today because you won't see criteria in the rest of the supply chain in the draft today, but a topic that we will bring back around to the community for feedback later. Great. And on another question, going back to the fibers, we had received a question, is there any possibility of adding regenerative fiber farming in the unified standard? I am not 100% positive if that's referring to, for example, like the um, farming for biomaterials that could be used in MMCF or in biosynthetics. We are looking at options for recognizing standards that already exist in that area. But regenerative, I wonder if it's referring to if our criteria are uh, covering regenerative practices. And that, yes, there are elements of that, but I think it's something that we would need to answer more thoroughly um, offline uh, with the right experts from that part of our standard. Thank you. Next, moving on, we have received a few questions around um, how the unified standard will link with existing tools that Textile Exchange is offering. Um, for example, one that was mentioned is the PFMM, but I know we also have a lot of other different tools. Yeah, so this is something that we have been working on bringing clarity uh, to the broader community about how the different tools that we offer within Textile Exchange are aligned and sync up versus how they're completely separate tools. Standards, um, in and of the nature of standards, they need to be independent tools that are not specifically influenced 
um, other than what we're doing through an open um, stakeholder feedback process and how that they're developed. But if we have other activity activities happening organizationally, we need to protect the independence of the standards. So the, the preferred fiber and materials matrix is a form of input where you know we um, are looking at how the criteria in the PFMM are designed and how does that help inform our standards. Uh, but we're not specifically trying to meet um, within our criteria certain levels within the PFMM. That's something that you know we have to unpack and explore in the future. But the processes have been developing at a similar time. So it's just it's not possible to stay completely synced with that. The way that the PFMM will be helpful to the unified standard system is when we look at recognition. So we are going to be looking at the levels established in the PFMM for how external standards are evaluated and using that as another form of input of when we move to our evaluation process to determine if a standard will be recognized for its certified inputs into the unified standard system. So we definitely, just like as if the PFMM was managed externally by a different organization, we definitely want to be using that information as uh, one form of input to the unified standard. Great. Then we have one more question. Is the track it tool going to be aligned with the unified standard? Yes. So I, it's uh, similar to what I was saying, where we have different tools organizationally that are in different phases of development. Right now, track it. It was already on track. Uh, uh, it's interesting using that word twice, but it was al already in its development phase, obviously, related to the standards that we have today. So that is the focus of the track it tools today. But it will need it will be the system that we have for traceability for transaction certificates and, and tokens and how we have supplementary traceability areas to the standards in the future. So track it will need to um, be updated and adapted for how it um, the unified standard rolls out. But similar to uh, what Trini was explaining on the timeline, we're on a pretty long trajectory for the unified standard. Um, in terms of when it becomes effective and then it when it becomes mandatory. So we'll continue working on track it um, to meet the needs of our standards today and then be looking at how it will adapt for the unified standard in the future. Great, we had one more question come in. Uh, asking about the basic criteria for getting any product certified with the unified standard system, and also what the methodology will be for verification and the audit process for any of those products. So I'm looking at the question too to try and understand. Um, I guess I'm not 100% positive the scope of the question, but we have in the unified standard expanded to new materials. So our plan is when the standard is finalized, it will cover more materials than we have covered in our standards today. Some of those materials are the ones that are candidates for recognition, where we want to look at pre-existing standards and accept um, though those audit processes and certified inputs coming from those other standards into the unified standard system at first processing. Um, so that's one way that we're looking at capturing more products. Um, it could this question could also be relating to uh, is it broader than te the textile industry? <clears throat> so, in uh, uh, in terms of the global recycled standard and the recycled claim standard, we have currently today materials, of course, we're accepting reclaimed feedstocks that are not textile. Um, so that's been part of how those standards have rolled out. So there's plastic waste, for example, that's accepted into to the GRS and RCS. But then we also have accepted when the reclaimed materials are processed for non-textile outputs. And that is a topic area that we're exploring is what does that look like in the unified standard system? Do we want the unified standard to continue that um, same scope where we're going to have 
final products that are part of the claims and labeling of the unified standard that are not in the textile industry. So that's an area that is under discussion and that we'll be sharing more information um, in case that's what that question relates to. There's the second part about the methodology and audit process. So again, um, I'm not knowing the exact nature of the question. Um, when it comes to the, the raw material level and the first processing, yes, the unified standards system will be capturing those areas within the supply chain for um, any of those materials that we have included in the scope of the system. I wonder also if part of the question is tied around principally how we work with certification bodies. So textile exchange as a standard setter is bringing out the tool the standard itself. And then we work with uh, or partner with certification bodies that will conduct the audit on the ground. So the certification relationship is between the certified site or to be certified site and the certification body. So we use a, a methodology of third party verification. Thanks, Trini. Excellent. That are all the questions we received as of right now. If any of the last questions are coming in, feel free to type them into the Q&A box. There may have been uh, some questions that we determined uh, we would like to have uh, another expert within our organization answer. So if your question didn't get answered, we will plan to provide that uh, separate from the webinar. I see another one, um, Trini, I hope you don't mind me jumping in, but uh, the, the question that just popped in about uh, whether human rights and livelihoods will cover due diligence throughout all of the tiers. That one we did answer earlier. Um, so it, you know, it relates to that the unified standard is focused on the raw material part of the supply chain and the very first processing of that material. And then the rest of the supply chain, um, tiers one through three are part of the content claim standard, which does not have those impact criteria such as human rights and livelihoods. That's right now how the future system is looking. But what I answered earlier is that we're looking at options for how we can cover these impact areas in the rest of the supply chain, but not as part of the, the normative or required set of criteria for achieving certification. Thank you. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that someone had their hand raised, though I'm not sure if that question got put into the Q&A box. But we are unable to unmute you. So if your question is still pending, please put it into the Q&A box. Ah, we received another question. Um, will the new standards apply to products in total and not just the materials? For example, GOTS and Okotex certify at a product level. So will the unified standard be for the entire product value chain? I will, if I understand correctly, the answer right now is no. So we're focused on the how the raw material is managed at tier four and then what are the the practices also at that first processing and then that forms you know what is the certified material as it continues through the rest of the supply chain but then the plan right now is that the rest of the supply chain is focused on chain of custody so that's the tracking and handling of the material but not looking at um, what i've been calling impact criteria so the additional like areas of um, chemicals that are used in the rest of the supply chain, such as at the dyeing phase. Um, that is not plan the plan for the unified standard system, 
as it appears to, or is constructed today. That's where we're looking at what are other options. So then when it comes to other standard systems that are looking at those additional criteria, that is part of the what we're looking at as options of how to um, work with those organizations and capture that information and track it. So that if, if track it is the system that um, for traceability purposes, that's going to, um, you know, for those who would like that to be the system that's tracking all of those attributes of a particular material as it moves through the supply chain to the final product, we are looking at what are the ways that we can capture that information and track it to keep it intact, but it, that it's better for us to allow other expert organizations that are working in those specific areas as they relate to whether it's energy use, chemical use, allow those um, organizations to be the ones that focus on those attributes um, rather than ourselves duplicating that work and needing to, to add that kind of expertise and and create kind of a, a duplication. So I hope that helps that I'm that I'm understanding well enough and answering um, to help the thinking. Well, thank you all. We are at time. If any additional questions are coming to mind, feel free to send them into standards at textileexchange.org. But with that, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Rose. Thank you to our speakers and thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, an email will be sent to all registered participants with a link to today's presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>